Right, okay. Okay, so, hi all, thank you for coming to the final Lunch Mass Cross Mum Seminar of 2020. Um, as always, this talk will be recorded, uh, but we'll have time for questions at the end and uh, that section won't be recorded, so you can ask whatever you like. Uh, we also are fortunate enough today to have Tim Virani speaking with us. Um, Tim's research interest is discrete models in classical statistical mechanics. Uh, lying at the intersection of mathematical physics, combinatorics, computer science, and probability theory. And in this talk, he'll be discussing why when you take a deck of cards and jumble, if you want to jumble it around, seven shuffles suffice. So I'll hand over to Tim now. Okay, uh, thanks, Emma Jane. Um, and so first of all, let me thank the organizers um, for letting me come and give this talk and also for managing to put on these talks in such um, bizarre circumstances this, this year. Um, I think this will hopefully have helped keep a bunch of you vaguely sane. Um, all right, so yeah, card shuffling. So we're gonna talk about a mathematical model for card shuffling. Um, and most of these results, I'll give some references at the end. Most of these are due to Percy, well, maybe everything is due to, well, actually no, most things are due to Percy Diaconis and Dave Bayer. Um, about 30 years ago. Um, all right, so what's a shuffle? Let's start off trying to be sort of vaguely precise about what we're talking about. So for us, a shuffle is just a particular way of rearranging a deck of cards. Okay, so it's not an ordering of cards, it's you take a deck of cards and you rearrange it in some manner. And that that method or that particular way you rearrange the cards is, is a shuffle, okay? And we're gonna model shuffles with permutations. And I need to click on that window. Uh -huh. Okay, so a permutation, if you haven't seen one before and hopefully you all have, but um, just to refresh your memory, a permutation on the first n integers is just a one-to-one -one map, right? From the first n integers to the first n integers. Okay, so that's all it is. And we're going to try for every, every given method of rearranging a deck of cards, we're going to try and associate it with a particular permutation, right? That's our, our first task. So there's, there's more than one natural way of doing that, um, but I'm just going to talk about one particular one, which has some advantages and maybe some disadvantages, but um, we'll just pick one and, and run with it. That's usually the best thing to do. Um, Okay, so let's consider if you've got, we'll just deal with an example with only five cards, to keep things simple. So all of the general statements we're gonna make apply to a deck of N cards, but let's, for purposes of drawing pictures and having examples, let's say we've got five cards. So we've got ace, two, three, four, five of spades. Now, if we shuffle one way of shuffling these cards, if they start off in their natural order, right, the way they turn up in a, when you buy a brand new deck of cards, one particular method would be to rearrange them into this, um, this ordering, right? Now, what permutation do we want to associate with this particular way of taking the five cards and re reordering them? Well, one very natural thing to do is to associate it with this permutation, right? So obviously, ace, ace and one, we're just identifying. But this is a very natural way of associating a permutation with this particular rearrangement. We just take the ordering here and we stick it down as the, the list of our images of this permutation. So if you haven't seen this notation for permutations before, this is called the two line notation for permutations. So the first line is the domain of your map. Remember a permutation is just a map from in this case, one to five to one to five. So you've got your domain up here, and then the second row is just lists all the corresponding images, right? So sigma maps one to three, and it maps two to one, and three to four, and four to five, and five to two, okay? And this is this three, one, four, five, two is precisely the ordering of the cards up here. Okay, so that seems probably pretty obvious, and maybe so obvious that you don't know why I'm making a song and dance about it, but it is, very useful to be kind of clear about exactly what the um, what the correspondence is that we're introducing here between rearrangements of the cards and the permutations. Okay, so what are we really doing? We're really saying that the card in position I 
after the deck is rearranged was in position sigma of i before the deck was rearranged. Okay, so let me just go through this so that we're kind of clear. So the card that was in position, well, the card that is in position one after we rearranged was in position sigma of one before it was rearranged. Okay, so what's sigma of one? It's three. So this card should have been in position three, which it was, and et cetera, et cetera. If you pick what, what's in the fourth position, well, it was the thing that should have been in sigma of four. What's sigma of four? It's five. Was this card in the fifth position originally? Yes. Okay. So this is the precise, in this gray box, this is the precise rule that we're using to um, associate ways of rearranging the cards with permutations. Okay. And just to emphasize this point again, the shuffles are a way of rearranging the deck. Okay. They're not a specific ordering of the deck. And likewise, the permutations are encoding this way of rearranging the deck. They are not telling us about an ordering of the deck. And to emphasize this point further, this same permutation also corresponds to the following rearrangements, okay? So say your cards weren't originally in their natural ordering, they were just in some other arbitrary ordering, four, one, three, two, five. Then this permutation, if you apply it, or you apply the shuffle corresponding to it, what do you get? You get this arrangement of the cards. Now, how do we know that? Well, the card in position one should have origin in after you shuffle, should have originally been in position sigma of one, which was three, and that's where it was. It was in the third position over here. And the card that's in position two should have been in position sigma of two, which is sigma of two is one. So this card here, which is a four, should have been in position one over here, which it was. Okay. And there's another example if you want to check it. So I won't go through all the images, but card in position four should have been in sigma of four, which is five. And yes, the ace was in position five originally. Okay. So if you start off in the natural ordering, this association between the shuffles and the permutation seems a little bit too obvious to be bothered being pedantic about, but we're going to want to repeat shuffles. And so we're not in general going to be applying this permutation to a naturally order deck of cards just to put to some sort of arbitrary arrangement of them. Okay, so it's it's useful to have be clear in your head what this association is between the shuffles and permutations. Okay, and I, I should say if if anything's unclear um, at any point, just stop me. Okay. We don't have to um, wait till the end for questions if you want to jump in and, and make me well ask me to clarify something. All right. So that's the relationship between shuffles and permutations. Now, we don't just want to um, shuffle once, right? That's never what we actually do in practice. What we do in practice is shuffle some number of times, okay? So if we've got a shuffle corresponding to a permutation sigma, and we've got a shuffle corresponding to a permutation tor, then we can perform those two shuffles consecutively on some arrangement of cards. So let's say that we start with the naturally ordered deck of cards again. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five. And then we just saw that if you apply the shuffle corresponding to sigma to this arrangement of cards, you get three, one, four, five, two. Now let's take that arrangement of cards and apply the shuffle corresponding to tor to it. Okay, so let's go back and think about what that means. So the card, after you do, after you apply tor to this ordering, the card that's in position one should have been in position tor of one. So where, what's position tor of one? It's four. So the thing that you put in the first slot here should have been in the, fo the fourth slot over here, and that's the five. Okay. And likewise, let's do one more. What should appear in the fifth slot? Well, it should be tor of five, which is three. So what was in the third slot? The four. So that's what it ends up over there, okay? All right, so that's really actually nothing new compared with what we had on the last slide. But the point is that this, if you look at the resulting ordering here, it's just again, some rearrangement of what this ordering, original ordering was. And so there's some permutation corresponding to that, right? You can leave out this middle, this middle man, and you can ask the question, what permutation jumps from the first ordering to the last ordering in one step? And it turns out that it's 
a very natural answer. It's the composition of sigma and tau. Okay. So um, yeah, we can let's remind ourselves what composition actually means. So what's the composition of sigma and tau? It's just defined so that sigma of tau, this is viewed as one map, right? Sigma composed with tau is one map. So if I feed in i, what do I get? I get sigma acting on tau of i. Okay. So the claim here is that if I compose these two permutations, I get this permutation. So let's just verify that that actually works. So what's the image of one under the composition? I feed tor and sorry, I feed one into tor, I get four, and then I feed that four into sigma, I get five. And yes, one is being mapped to five by the composition. And let me pick just one other one, um, one other point in the domain. So where does four get mapped to under the composition? I feed four into tor, I get five. And then I feed five into sigma, I get two. And yes, that's that's exactly what I'm getting here, right? Four is getting mapped to two. And if you sit down and and again take this permutation and ask the question, forget about where it came from now, right? This sigma composed with tor is just this permutation. Now let's just apply this permutation to the original arrangement of cards. What arrangement of cards do we get? So we use the same rule that we just introduced on the last slide. So um, the card in position one should have been what was in the image of one previously. So what's the image of one? It's five. So this card should have been what was in the fifth slot over here, and it is. And you can verify that the rest of the cards appear in this order. And that is the, the point is that this arrangement and this arrangement are precisely the same thing. Okay. So because of our choice of how we decided to associate shuffles and permutations, we have this really nice way of encoding repeated shuffles just with compositions of the permutations, okay? So repeating two shuffles corresponds to composing the permutations corresponding to those shuffles. Okay, now one, one question that if you haven't come across you know, thought about permutations too much before that you should be asking yourself is, well, how do I know that the thing that I get when I compose these two permutations is actually another permutation? Um, and that's not very hard to prove for yourself. You can sit down and do that in a few lines. Um, and because partly because of that fact, if you think about the set of um, all permutations from one to n to one to n, it has a particularly nice structure, which is a group structure under composition, okay? So you take the set of all permutations and you endow that with map composition, you get a group called the symmetric group, okay? And so what's a group? If you haven't seen a group before, it's just a set where you know how to multiply two things together to get something else in that set. And in sort of a nice way where every everybody has an inverse, okay? So, um, and the set of all permutations is symmetric group is a has this property, right? So we, we always take, if we compose two permutations, we get another permutation and every permutation can be undone, right? It has an inverse. Okay, so that's how we model repeated shuffles. Now, when we actually do this in practice, well, depending on your perspective, I don't know what practice means, but the, we want to introduce some randomness into this game, right? So when we actually shuffle things, most of us aren't dexterous enough to precisely start with this ordering of the cards and put it in some desired ordering of cards. We just do something or other and it'll end up in some other ordering, right? So it's, it's reasonable to assume that there's a, an element of randomness when you perform a shuffle, just because most of us are too clumsy for there not to be some element of randomness. Um, okay, so. Let's suppose that you've got two random permutations. So you've got one shuffle and then you do another shuffle and that your choice for how you do the second shuffle has nothing to do with your choice for how you did the first shuffle. Or in other words, what you did for the first shuffle doesn't influence your choice for what you do for the second shuffle, okay? So they're independent in the probabilistic sense. And let's say these two shuffles have some probability distributions, Q1 and Q2, okay? So what's Q1? Q1 is a function from the symmetric group, Sn, right? It picks a permutation 
and it assigns it uh, a real number between zero and one. And it does it in such a way that if you add up these numbers over all the elements of the symmetric group, over all the permutations, you get one, right? That's all that Q1 is, okay? It's just some nice function from permutations to numbers where all the entries are positive and they all add up to one. And so same for Q2. So if I pick, so sigma one is random, the probability that it's anything, any particular um, permutation sigma is Q1 of sigma, okay? So then you can ask the question, what's the probability that if I compose sigma one and sigma two, I get some other fixed permutation sigma? So let's just be, this is possibly slightly bad notation here, but um, let me just be, try and be clear about what I mean. So sigma one and sigma two are random, but sigma is something fixed. So you decide I'm interested in permutation sigma, right? You just fix that permutation. And then you ask, if I've got these two random permutations, what's the probability that when I compose them, I get sigma? Because there's gonna be more than one way of taking two permutations and composing them to get sigma. So what's the probability that if you pick your two random ones and compose them, you do get sigma? Well, there's a, there's a nice expression for that probability. So let's, let's just think about it. Well, just in terms of, from probability theory, just in starting from um, first principles, it's going to be the sum over all choices of sigma one and sigma two, um, such that their composition gives you sigma. It's going to be the sum over the probability of picking sigma one and sigma two. Now, what's the probability of picking sigma one and sigma two? Well, sigma one and sigma two were independent. So the probability of picking sigma one and sigma two is the product of their individual probabilities. So this is what independence does for you, okay? The probability is just a simple product of the two ind uh, individual probabilities. Okay, now, because everybody has an inverse, sigma one has an inverse, um, we can take this constraint, right? Remember, sigma is fixed and we're summing over sigma one and sigma two. We can take this constraint and we can hit both sides of it with sigma one inverse. So this will give us sigma two equals sigma one inverse composed with sigma. So I'm summing over sigma one. For every value of sigma one, there's now only one value of sigma two that's going to contribute to the sigma two sum, right? Sigma two has to be sigma one inverse composed with sigma. So I don't actually have two sums here because for every element, of the first sum, there's only one element of the second sum that satisfies this constraint. So I really just have a sum over um, sigma one, right? And now sigma two gets replaced with sigma one inverse composed with sigma. And this may not look like a particularly um, simple object, but this is in fact an object that turns up all over the place. And you've probably seen a version of this um, hopefully, when you've taken uh, Fourier analysis somewhere along the way. So this is an example of what's called a convolution, okay? So this new distribution, and you can prove that this is also a probability distribution. If you sum over sigma, you get all sigma, you get one. So this new function, this new distribution is called the convolution of Q1 and Q2, okay? So what we've learned is that the distribution of a composition of two permutations is the convolution of the original two distributions, assuming that the original two permutations were independent. Okay. Now we're not going to use the specific details of what a convolution is really at all again, possibly, but it is it's important to know that this is this is what you get when you can for the distribution of the composition of two independent permu uh, permutations. And this is a really common object that does appear sort of all over the place. Okay. So all of this so far has been um, really quite general. We haven't said anything specific about what kinds of shuffles we've been talking about, right? We've just been saying any way of arranging a deck of cards, that's a shuffle and you can, encode that with a permutation. But in practice, 
people generally do fairly specific things when they say they're going to shuffle a deck of cards. And what we really want to talk about is the riffle shuffle. So what's a riffle shuffle? A riffle shuffle consists of two steps. And this is maybe where I will try and, um, this might end up being a disaster. Let me, <laughs> I'm gonna try and demonstrate a real shuffle for you. Okay, and it turns out that I have to turn off my virtual background to do this, otherwise uh, it doesn't work. So let's hopefully you can see my desk. Okay, so this is what we mean by a riffle shuffle. So you take your deck of cards, there's two steps. The first is to cut your deck of cards, right? Just cut it out into two packets, okay? Okay, so now we have two packets, that's the cut. The second step in the riffle shuffle is to actually do the riffle. So we're going to take these two packets and we're going to interleave them together, okay? So you do something like this. And if you look at this, what have we actually got? If I can hold it up, you can see that we've interleaved the cards together, okay? So that is one riffle shuffle. And I'll turn my... So that's virtual background. That's the kind of shuffle that we want to model. So where's my, oh, I got a chat. Okay. Um, where's my talk there? Okay. Okay, so it consists of two steps. The first step is to cut the deck into two packets. And then the second step is to, so you've got this, you've got your, your two packets, Actually, the background's messing that up again. You've got your two packets, and then you sort of interleave them together in some in some manner. Okay, and it's we can think of a nice way of sort of slowing down the interleaving process so that we can picture it better. So the interleaving can be viewed in an iterative manner in the following way. So you choose what you do at each at each step is you choose one of the two packets and you drop the bottom card from that packet down onto the top of the pile. That's really what we're doing. When we're using our thumbs or we're choosing which of the two packets we're gonna drop a card um, from onto the top, onto our desk, onto the top of the, the pile that we've got. And then we just keep doing this until both the packets are empty. Okay, and we sort of have, you know, as we go along, we're sort of trying to make the packets stay to be roughly the same size as we go, but I'll talk more about that um, later. So, okay, so how would we, let's look at a concrete example on our five cards again. So, say we've got one, two, three, four, five. What's one possible riffle shuffle you could do? Well, you could cut, cut it into packets in this way. So take packet one to have two cards and packet two to have three cards. Right, that's the cut. So when after you've done the cut, there's still nothing in the pile. The pile turns up as you go through the interleaving process. So packet one, so in this particular um, riffle shuffle, what we've done is we've chosen packet one for the first step of interleaving. And then we drop the second card, sorry, the, the bottom card, um from packet one onto the top of the pile okay so we chose packet one and we take its bottom card and stick it on the top of the pile and then in the next iteration of interleaving all right this time we chose packet two and we dropped its bottom card onto the top of the pile so the five went on the top of the pile then in this one we've picked next step we've picked packet two again so the bottom card goes onto the top of the pile then we pick packet one there's only one card left, but it's the bottom card in that packet. So the, the, card, the only card in packet one goes onto the top of the pile. And then when you do packet two, well, the next step, you have to pick packet two because it's the only card with any, the only packet with any cards left. And this is the arrangement of cards you get, okay? So this, and this is the original example we had on the first slide. This is a way of achieving that, re, that rearrangement using a ripple shuffle. Okay, now, it's not um, the case that all permutations can be constructed from a single riffle shuffle, right? It's, it's definitely not. 
So why not? Well, there's a very simple reason for that. And it has to do with these things called rising sequences in a permutation. So a rising sequence in a permutation is a maximal consecutively increasing subsequence, right? So that sounds like a mouthful. So let's just have a look at an example. So here is our, our favorite example of a permutation. Now, what are the rising sequences in this permutation? Well, we need a, a subsequence of consecutively increasing um, elements in our list of images, right? So here's one consecutively increasing sub subsequence, one, two. And here's another one, three, four, five. Um, now, Mac, three, four is also a consecutively increasing subsequence, but it's not maximal because I've left five out. Oh, sorry, I've left five off and I could, I could include five, okay? So the maximal consecutively increasing subsequences are three, four, five, and one, two. And so there are our two rising sequences. Now, let's say R of sigma is the number of rising sequences. So R of this permutation is two, is two rising sequences. And the identity per permutation, just as a, another example, the identity has precisely one rising sequence, right? Because one, two, three, four, five is a um, consecutively increasing subsequence. Okay, now, why, why do we care about rising sequences? Well, the point is that riffle shuffles correspond to permutations with either one or two ri uh, rising sequences, right? You can't have more than two. And generic, generically, you'll have exactly two. So why do you get two? Well, the answer to that is actually pretty simple, right? Because you take your, you take your deck of cards and you cut it in some way, but then when you interleave them back together, each packet retains its, its original ordering, right? Its relative ordering. So each packet is going to be a rising sequence, unless you happen to choose a sort of a pathological case where you, you cut your deck of cards, but then you interleave them back together so that you get the, you get the identity permutation. In that case, you only have one rising sequence, but that's sort of an uninteresting case. You have to keep track of it, but generically, you're going to get two rising sequences um, when you do a ripple shuffle. And that just comes about because of the two packets retain their relative order to each other. Well, within, a, within themselves, I should say. Okay, so that's a ripple shuffle and we have an understanding of which permutations correspond to riffle shuffles. But remember, we really want to talk about random shuffles. So we need a model for riffle shuffles. And it turns out that, like most good things um, in maths, this good ideas are often discovered independently by more than one group of people. And so this thing called the Gilbert Shannon Reads model was discovered by Gilbert and Shannon, or written down, depending on your philosophy, um, written down by Gilbert and Shannon, um, I think in the 50s or the 60s, and then by Reads, uh, I think in the early 80s. And this Shannon here is the, the famous information theorist, Claude Shannon. Um, so apparently at Bell Labs, even when they were doing extremely fundamental things in information theory, they had time to think about card shuffling. Um, so riffle shuffles can be modeled as follows. And it turns out, um, I've never done the experiment um, in this direction myself, but it turns out uh, the authors of the paper that I'm gonna talk about shortly, um, Dave Bayer and Percy Diaconis, they tested this statistically, the model that I'm about to write down. And apparently it works as a pretty good model for the types of shuffles that Dave Bayer did and not very well for the types of shuffles that Percy Diaconis did. but that's probably because in addition to being an extremely famous mathematician, Diaconis, sorry, yeah, um, Diaconis was also a quite skilled magician. And so he knows how to shuffle cards. He, he knows how to do perfect shuffles of cards. So he's extremely dexterous. So this is not a good model apparently for how extremely dexterous people shuffle cards, probably because there's not enough randomness for in shuffles of extremely dexterous people. But for 
garden variety, typical clumsy people like me, apparently this is a pretty good model of how we, we shuffle cards, even, uh, stati even statistically. Okay, so what's the model? So we're gonna cut the deck um, into two packets, right? One, one of size P1, one of size P2. P1 and P2 are random, but they're related. Obviously P2 is N minus P1. So P1 is random. We need to say what its distribution is. And the main um, ingredient in the Gilbert Shannon reads model is to assume that this distribution is, is binomial, okay? So the probability that it has size little p1 is n choose little p1 um, normalized, okay, by one on two to the n. Okay, so this is a, a nice, simple, discrete probability distribution. Why is it reasonable? Well, if you've never seen a picture of this distribution, it, it's like a discrete version of the, the bell curve, Gaussian, okay, so it's, and it's centered around um, n on two. So it's giving most weight to when you cut the deck in half, exactly in half, and then there'll be like fluctuations around that, okay? Which seems kind of kind of natural. You'd want something like that. Okay, so once you've chosen the cut, what else can you do? Well, the interleaving is modeled as follows. So you pick one of the two packets, and you pick that packet with a probability that is proportional to the size of that packet. Okay, so if you've got one really big packet and one really small packet, you're more likely to drop a card from the big packet at that step in the interleaving, which, which makes sense, because you sort of want to keep your packets roughly balanced, okay? And this denominator here is just to normalize things so you get a probability, so that's not very important. But the point is you're choosing which packet to drop a card from proportional to its size, which I think is pretty reasonable. And so after you've dropped a card, you just go back and repeat this step. You don't repeat the cut, the cut's done once and for all. You repeat this step um, with one fewer cards in, your, in the ith packet. Okay, so let's look at an example of how this um, assigns probabilities. So um, this is, we're gonna look through our uh, standard example again, but assigning probabilities to each of the steps now. So to start, say we've got our five cards and we do this cut into a cut with two cards and in the first packet and three cards in the second packet. What's the probability of that? Well, we're saying it's five, because n is five if we've got five cards. Five choose two, which is 10, times one on two to the five, which is one on 32, and 10 on 32 is five on 16. Okay, so that's the cut. Now, what's the probability of the next, uh, of the particular interleaving that we were looking at? So this interleaving corresponds to picking packet one. So what's the probability of pack picking packet one? Well, it's two divided by five. And now in this step, we pick packet two. So what's the probability of picking packet two in this step rather than packet one? Well, there's three things in packet two and there's only one thing in packet one, so there's four in total. So the probability here is three over four. And likewise, we pick packet two again. The probability of doing that was proportional to how many things were in packet two, there's two. So it's two over the total number of cards at that iteration, so two thirds. And then we pick packet one with probability a half because we could have picked either here with the same probability and then we have to pick uh, uh, packet two in the last step. So it happens with probability one. Okay, so that, they're the probabilities of each of these steps. And we're assuming that each of these steps is independent of each other. So the total, the overall probability of performing this sequence of random choices um, is the product of all these probabilities, right? That's what independence tells you. And so the probability of doing this particular um, cut and interleaving process is five choose two on one uh, on divided by two to the five, which is coming from the cut probability distribution. And then it's just the product of all of these factors here. Now, the, the factors sort of look a little bit 
complicated if you think about which order they're turning up in, right? Because they could turn up in all sorts of orders. But that's not actually important because we're just multiplying them all together and we don't care what order we multiply them in together. The point is that no matter which of the interleavings you get, you're going to have exactly the same factors. Now, why is that? That's because if you want to start with, well, let's think about the denominators to start with. At each step, when you do this, you're decreasing the denominator by one, right? Because either you decrease P1 by one or you decrease P2 by one. So the fact that we have five, four, three, two, one is no accident. We're removing a card from our two, from one of our two packets at each step. So the, the denominator is going down by one every step. So that's easy, right? The denominator, denominator has to be five factorial, five times four times three times two times one. Now, what's the numerator? Well, the numerator has to be, no matter what order we do the interleaving in, we've got to start with packet one, and at some step, we've got to remove a card from it. And then at another step, no matter where it happens, we've got to remove another card from it, and then another card, and then another card until we have zero, okay? So if there's two cards here, we have to have a step where, there's, where we take the two, and we have to have a step where we take the one, right? And in, if uh, in packet two, there's three cards initially. So there's gotta be some step where we reduce three to two, and a step where we reduce two to one, and then a step where we reduce one to zero. So there's the three times two times one. This comes from packet two. And the two times one comes from packet one. And the magical thing is that this factor here is precisely five choose two again. And this one, or one on five choose two, and this one on five choose two exactly cancels five choose two, and you find that every sequence of um, cuts and interleavings gives you exactly the same probability. Okay, so that's another way of looking at what Gilbert Shattered Reads is telling you. Every choice of the cut and interleaving gives you the same overall probability. Okay. So the Gilbert Shannon Reads model is basically this sort of random process that'll that induces a random permutation, right? But it doesn't do it in a completely direct way. So we need to think about when you take a deck of cards and you do this random process on it, you'll get another arrangement of the cards. So there's got to be some permutation corresponding to that rearrangement of the cards, right? And it's going to be a random permutation because we're talking about a random way of rearranging the cards. So what's the distribution of this random permutation? Okay, that's where we're, we're really interested in. What's the distribution of this random permutation? So let's look at that in a slightly smaller example now, right? So if we take three cards, then it's not hard to write down all the possible choices for the cut and all the possible choices for the resulting interleavings. Okay, so we'll just solve n equals three explicitly and then sort of guess the pattern. Okay, so if you've got three cards, what can P1 be? Well, P1 could be zero. That's not a very interesting case. It doesn't happen with huge probability, or at least when n is big, it doesn't. Um, but so the first packet could be empty, and then the second packet is the whole deck. And then there's only one interleaving of that, right? So you've got nothing in the first packet and then you just drop all of the cards onto the pile. and So there's only one interleaving and it's, it corresponds to the identity permutation. You haven't actually done anything. All right. What's more interesting is if you pick packet one to have size one. If you pick packet one to have size one, then there's three possible interleavings. You could do the three and the two, drop the three and the two and then drop the one. Or you could drop the three and then the one and then the two. Or you could drop the one and then the three and the two. So you'll get these three possible interleavings. And similarly, if you make packet one have size two, so then it's the ace and the two, and then packet two will just be the, just be card three. Um, there's three possible interleavings corresponding to that. So you could go drop three and then drop two and then drop one, or you could drop two and then drop three and then drop one, or you could drop two and one and then three. So there you have three possible interleavings. And then just as a last trivial case, um, you could decide that packet one 
was the entire deck and packet two was empty. And then there's only one um, possible interleaving of that. And that's the, the trivial one again. Okay, so you'll notice that the identity permutation is turning up more than once. All of the other permutations are only turning up once. But do we have all of the permutations in S3 here? And the answer is no, right? And we sort of already knew that we shouldn't because we're only supposed to get permutations that have at most two rising sequences. So the identity permutation corresponding to these ones has one rising sequence. These four have two rising sequences. And S3 has three factorial equals six elements. We've got one, two, three, four, five elements here, which are all the ones corresponding to one or two rising sequences. The complete reversal, three, two, one, that permutation is not here because it has three rising sequences. Okay, you can't Just a quick question, Tim. Yes. Do we get different. every rising sequence? Or just like some um, of like number two? You get all of the possible permutations corresponding to two. Yeah, that's a good question. I haven't actually... Yeah, you're right. I didn't actually say that it's an if and only if. Yeah, but you're right. You always get um, all of the, the 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 size two rising sequences, just because um, I guess yeah. For any particular wave, yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> Let me not waste too much time. The answer is yes. Um, okay. So what's the distribution now? Um, so the probability of picking any particular sigma or generating any particular sigma with this random process is four for the identity, right? The one that has one rising sequence. Otherwise, it's just one on two to the three, okay? Because each of these choices, remember, each choice of cut and interleaving happens with probability um, one on two to the three. That's what we proved on the last slide. And so there's a degeneracy of four for the identity one. and then each of the other ones occurs once. And there's probability zero of generating any other permutations. And you can write this, um, this might not seem like it's an improvement, but you can, it is. You can write this expression more generally using the following. And this is, so this is just a binomial coefficient. So if R equals something bigger than two, then you'll have something less than n in the top of this binomial. And then you'll have something less than n, choose n, and that's zero. Okay, so this is definitely zero when r is bigger than two. If r is equal to two, this is n choose n, which is one, which is what we've got here. And if r is um, one, this is n plus one choose n, which is n plus one. And again, that's what we have here for the n equals three case. So this, is the general expression for the probability distribution on permutations if you do a single riffle shuffle. Okay. Right, now, we don't want to do a single riffle shuffle. This is where it starts getting interesting. We want to perform a sequence of riffle shuffles. So we want to start with a given deck and we want to successively apply a number of independent riffle shuffles. And so the question then is, what's the distribution of the resulting permutation that you get? Right? So performing k riffle shuffles corresponds to some way of rearranging your deck of cards, and therefore there's some associated permutation with that way of rearranging your cards. Now, the way of re rearranging your cards was random, so the associated permutation is random. So what's the distribution of this permutation? Well, we've already seen that if you um, uh, concatenate or repeat two shuffles, two rearrangements of your cards, that corresponds to the um, two random ones. The distribution of their composition is the convolution of the original distributions. So if you've got two random permutations with distribution R and you're interested in the distribution of their composition, then it's the convolution of R with itself. R uh, uh, convolved with R. If you do it k times, then it's R convolved with R k times. So that's what I mean by R to the k. 
Okay, so the power here is convolution. The multiplication here is convolution. Okay, so the answer, and, and this is our distribution after, because of what we said earlier on in the, in the talk, this is our distribution after K ripple shuffles. One of the main results in this paper by Bayer and Diaconis was to show that the distribution after K shuffles has this extremely simple form compared with the, the one shuffle case. So if you look back at the one shuffle case, all that we do to get the K shuffle case is to replace two with two to the K. Okay, now it's not obvious why that's true, um, but it turns out to be the case. And if I had a little bit more time, I could wave my hands about why that comes about, but I think we're probably gonna be pushing it for time. So let's just take that as, as given. We have this really nice, sort of simple result that just has, it's got a binomial coefficient and as long as you know how to compute how many rising sequences your permutation has, then you can write down the distribution exactly. Okay, so why, why do we care about that? So let's go back right to the start so that we can think about how to interpret this result. So the first question is, why do you even bother shuffling cards in the first place? Okay, now we don't shuffle cards just as entertainment in its own right. We shuffle cards because we want to play a game of cards with some of our friends. And the first thing that we do is we want to shuffle the cards some number of times to randomize the deck because the kind of card games that we typically play have some element of chance and we don't want anybody to have an unfair advantage. Right? So we want to shuffle the decks to randomize the decks. So it's a it's a practical, there's a practical reason for doing shuffling. We want to randomize the deck. Now, what does that mean? Well, ideally, what you would like is to take your deck of cards from the lot that you used in the last game of cards and stick it in some kind of fancy electrified card shuffling machine. And what pops out is a rearrangement of the deck of cards, which has exactly uniform probability distribution, right? Every possible arrangement of the deck of cards would happen with probability one on n factorial. Now, that's clearly not what happens when you do K riffle shuffles, because this is the distribution after K riffle shuffles. So the really interesting question is how big do you have to make K so that the thing that you do get after K riffle shuffles is sufficiently close to what you would ideally like it to be, right? One on N factorial. So let's formalize this a little bit. Um, so the uniform distribution is on SN is just the distribution that assigns everybody probability one on N factorial. So if we want to know how close, so what we really want to know is how close is RK to U. So the first question that we need to address when we're talking about, you know, closeness is we need some notion of distance. Now, usually in mathematics, there's not one natural notion of distance in some space that you're interested in, but in probability theory, and that's also true in probability theory, but one of the most natural ones is this thing called the total variation distance. So what is this saying? This is saying that we say the distance between RK and U is the biggest distance between individual probabilities that RK would assign and U would assign to any probabilistic question you could ask, right? So when you're, when you're taking the max over all subsets of SN, you're, uh, you're looking at all possible ways of, uh, of all possible probabilistic questions, right? So you're sampling a random permutation, you could ask a question like, what's the probability this thing has three rising sequences? What's the probability this thing always maps seven to seven. What's the probability that this is an even permutation, if you know what that means? Um, now, so all of those are, are probabilistic questions that you could ask. And if one sort of fairly strict way of saying RK is close to you is if no matter what probabilistic question you want to ask, the answer you get from RK is close to what you get from you. Okay, so that's our definition of distance. This is called the total variation distance. Okay, now it turns out, so that's kind of the motivation from probability here. I think that's why you should be interested in this notion of distance. It turns out that this is basically just, well, it is just the half times the L1 distance. So this sum. 
which is kind of good news because this has in factorial terms in it, this thing here has two to the n factorial things that you need to uh, maximize over. But if you tried to compute this thing directly in Mathematica, this would still be hopeless because 52 factorial is, I, mean, I, I dare you to try and get Mathematica to compute a sum with 52 factorial terms. But the good news is that we know RK of sigma doesn't depend on the specific details of sigma. It only depends on how many rising sequences it has, okay? And there's only n choices for how many rising sequences of permutation can have. So using what we know about RK of sigma, you can actually replace this sum over SN with just a sum over n elements, counting how many rising sequences your permutations have. And you get this really nice explicit result for, um, for the distance between RK and U. Okay, so now the only thing that I've sort of scribbed over so far is what this A and R is, and that's the number of um, rising, the number of permutations on N things that have R rising sequences. Now that sounds like a sort of esoteric thing that maybe would make this problem hard, but it turns out this is something that people have been interested in for a couple of centuries at least anyway, and they're called the Larian numbers and combinatorialists know all about them. And there's nice explicit recursions for them. You can even write down exact expressions for them. It's finite sums. So they're not scary. I won't go into what exactly they look like, but they're not scary and they're well understood. Okay, so this is kind of, I guess, the main result in this paper by Bayer and Diaconis. Now, what does it actually look like if you plot a 52 card deck? It looks like the following. So you'll see, and this is, I guess, sort of the interesting part, you'll see that, now one thing to observe, and I know I'm running out of time, so I'll wrap up kind of quickly. One thing you observe is that the dis this thing here, this distance is always bounded by one, right? Because the biggest this can be is one and the smallest this can be is zero. So this is bounded by one. So these are maximal distance. After one shuffle, two shuffle, three shuffles, four shuffles, you're really still at maximal distance. Uh, K shuffles is as far away from uniform as you could possibly imagine, even after four shuffles, if you've got 52 cards in your deck. But then once you start getting to five shuffles, something interesting happens. You start falling off this cliff. Six shuffles, you made some progress, and everywhere between, say, five and eight, or five and nine, or five and 10, depending on your perspective, you're making fairly significant progress. And so you have fast decay between five and eight. And the first time your total variation distance gets less than a half is at seven. And this is why people say seven shuffles suffice. Now, if you're being fussy, it depends how tolerant you are. If you're being fussy and you wanted your distance to be even smaller, maybe you want 10 shuffles. Maybe you want 12 shuffles. It's a little bit ambiguous, but this is the exact answer. And it, it was a much nicer title to say seven than to say whatever K that makes this smaller than epsilon shuffles suffice. Right? That, I probably wouldn't have had anybody turn up. Okay, so I think I'm pretty much out of time. That's the, the gist of it. There are a couple of extra things that, um, you, well, ways in which you could generalize this, which I can talk about in questions if anybody's curious, but I recommend, um, if you like this kind of stuff, go and check out the original paper by Dave Bayer and Percy Diaconis. And also if there's Monash students and you have to take that science communication unit, you haven't taken it already, and you still have to take a, you still have to get an original research paper to, to talk about, this is a really good example. It's, it's really interesting. There's lots of really deep, beautiful maths in there, but it's also pretty, pretty co it's, it's fairly accessible to an undergrad. But uh, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Tim. Um, could everyone please unmute themselves and give Tim a round of applause? Um, okay. Uh